They got Rocky down with three witnesses, heavyweight. They scared him. You know, you put a bullet door to a guy's head. I know. Right? Just, right, okay, yeah. Okay. But here's the gimmick with Sony. Believe it or not, the images here are all captured with an iPhone 15 Pro Max. There's no added effects, no special blurring, only a color correction pass. The skin tones look great. The image has depth and texture, and the flares are authentic. Agent Rose, I just realized something. I'm listening. So what does it take to get an iPhone to capture images like this? Or perhaps a better question is, why would you even want to? Well, let's take a quick look at a breakdown. One and eight, take one, marker. What you're seeing here is going to look a little different. This is still an iPhone 15 Pro Max recording with the Blackmagic camera app and a custom LUT. Now let's add a 235 mat for framing and then add a color correction pass. Notice the boxes in the foreground give us a sense of depth, but the rest of the image is on a pretty flat plane. We call this deep depth of field because most of the image falls into one long plane of focus. And while this is a nice image, the most important ingredients to getting an iPhone 15 to look like this are good lighting, good production design, and good performances. Now let's try another image. This is also captured with the iPhone 15 Pro Max. Still the Blackmagic camera app and a custom LUT. Let's add the color pass, but this image is already widescreen. Notice how the boxes in the foreground are naturally out of focus. The reason why is this image is recorded using an Atlas Mercury anamorphic lens, a 42 millimeter to be exact. And the male characters in the background are a bit softer than the woman in the center. The shallower depth of field produces more depth and forces the eye to focus on the main character, a common attribute in any type of storytelling. If we play them back together, we can compare how even with the same camera, same angle, and same lighting, most people would agree the anamorphic lens is adding something special to the image and in some ways elevates the look and feel. We rigged several practical lights in the scene to react with the haze which diffuses and then softens the light, but you'll notice how the anamorphic lens increases the blooming radius and also adds additional colored flares. We used a flashlight to increase the intensity of those flares even more. Take a look at the geometric properties. The iPhone alone has angles and lines that are nearly perfect. This is called rectilinear, whereas the straight lines on the anamorphic lens are distorted and have a bit of bowing to them. In terms of sharpness and density, iPhone is both crisper and more uniform from edge to edge, whereas the anamorphic lens naturally gets softer as you move away from the center. The anamorphic also has a pronounced edge vignette, which isn't visible on the iPhone lens. Again, the only difference between these two images is the lens. And if the difference is this dramatic and you want an authentic anamorphic image, how did we get it all to work? Well, let's first go back to episode 18. In that episode, cinematographer Shannon Stutenroth lit a scene for an iPhone 15, and we used AI to generate a depth map so we could decrease the depth of field, giving us the impression the image was shot with a larger sensor that natively has shallower depth of field. But in order to get those images, we had to create a pretty large rig. On our last iPhone shoot, we used pretty much every accessory that you can also use on a cinema camera. We used like top of the line stuff because that's what we had, it's what we had access to and it's, it's the way that we knew how to build a camera. Shannon and I were happy with the results the professional accessories helped create, but when we published the episode, we received a little criticism. The main complaint was, if you have a cheap phone and a bunch of expensive gear around it, professional equipment overcomes the low quality of the phone. Okay. Maybe. But what interests me is that with over 500 comments, almost none of them questioned the quality of the result. That means iPhone, when coupled with professional people and professional gear, is reasonably capable of capturing a professional image. Don't miss that. That's new. So Shannon and I started thinking, well, what would happen if we didn't use professional accessories? So for this iPhone shoot, we approached this with a little bit more of affordability in mind, and we decided to go with accessories that um, are off the shelf prices, much more affordable than what we did on the last iPhone shoot. One viewer suggested to us, why not use a real anamorphic lens instead of using AI to generate synthetic depth of field? And we thought that was a great idea. So we built a rig to try this out. And remember, we chose to limit our camera accessories to off the shelf tools, but that still requires talented people 
to make it look good. What you're seeing here today is a lot of hard work, a lot of talent, and an entire team behind the iPhone making it look the way that it does. So don't be deceived thinking that this is something that we just set up in a little bit and press record. It took a lot of time to sculpt the image that you're seeing. So now the big question, how can we equip a talented group of people to create the most cost-effective anamorphic camera setup? Well, it all starts with an iPhone 15 Pro Max. And as we all know, when it comes to design, much of Apple's motivation is in making their products appealing to look at. But good aesthetics don't necessarily mean they're designed for production. That's why we need to start by properly housing the camera so it can be configured with other tools and we don't drop it. For that, we turn to B-Script, which makes the Beast cage for iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. These cages both retail for $150 US. The phone sits tightly in the cage when it's snapped in. Around the cage are 10 quarter 20 mounts and a cold shoe mount. The $75 side handle has a quick release as well as a $50 top handle, which also has a cold shoe and allows for additional mounting and rigging points. You can use the cage with the standard iPhone lenses or add three hot swappable lens adapters, which can be quickly removed with a thumb screw. There are several external lens options based on your shooting configurations, including a wide, a telephoto, and even two anamorphic squeeze options which retail for about $200 each. There's also a great macro lens for $119, bringing the investment in this whole set of lenses to a total of $940 US. Now, shooting large files to iPhone fills it up fast, so it's necessary to capture your media externally. The cold shoe atop the handle is a perfect place to mount a recording drive, so we went with the small rig universal holder, which is $40. To make the cable connection easier, we rigged a Refiris USB-C 90 degree adapter, which comes in a pack of four for 12 bucks. We need a fairly robust SSD to hold our media, so we went with the Sabrent Nano Rocket 2 because I like that it's designed with a really thick rubber housing. The two terabyte model is $170 and its USB-C port connects directly to the 90 degree Refiris adapter with sustained transfer speeds of 1500 megabytes per second. All this can easily mount to virtually any tripod and can quickly be configured for lightweight handheld needs. If we stick with the stock iPhone lenses, everything we have here can be purchased for $497 US in addition to the iPhone Pro Max, which retails for $1,200. But again, if we look at the images shot on the iPhone 15, they look really good, but it always has me wanting less depth of field. And I think I know why. First, the best performing lens on the iPhone 15 is the 24 millimeter. This focuses light to a sensor that's only a 12 millimeter diagonal. The sensor is so small and the lens is so wide that it creates a lot of depth of field, compromising our control over Z depth. It's why smartphone video always looks kind of flat. It also makes it really hard to do a nice close up. So to deal with this, we need a bigger sensor. And this is about the part of the episode where a lot of people are gonna comment, a phone isn't a cinema camera. Just shoot on a real cinema camera and you'll get better results. Look, I know that. That's not a debate today. So I hear you. And then you ask, well, then why even do this experiment at all? Well, that's easy. One, pushing boundaries and challenging yourself with your friends is fun. Two, experimenting, especially with self-imposed limitations, is how we build muscle. It's how we learn new things. And three, learning is the fuel for inspiration. It's where innovations are regularly born. So I don't need to be reminded that cinema cameras are better than an iPhone. I know that. I agree with you today. So now I have a question for you. What do you actually think makes a cinema camera a cinema camera? It's not the brand because brands come and go. It's not the size and shape because some are four pounds and some cameras are 40 pounds. I actually think it boils down to five things. First, it needs to have cinematic resolution. Today, that means 4K or above. Second, it needs to encode files using intra-frame encoding. That can mean RAW or RGB files, but they must not be encoded using web compression group of pictures compression codecs like H.264, VP9, or HEVC. They're out. Third, it must capture high dynamic range. That means it must record logarithmically beyond 12 stops, meaning no baked in gamma correction. Fourth, it must capture color with at least 10 bits per pixel, which means it contains more than 60 times more color fidelity than 8-bit web encoding cameras. And lastly, it needs to have removable lenses so filmmakers have total control over the look and feel as well as focal lengths. 
So visually speaking, this list is really important to every cinema camera. And since iPhone 15 Pro meets most of these specs, it's also the reason why the iPhone product line may not be completely unreasonable for cinema solutions in a few years. But that fifth item on my list is not something iPhone does today. So if iPhone is ever gonna be legitimately considered as a cinema solution, it needs to have a bigger sensor. And since we don't have that, we have to make one. So how do we do that? Well, we can use a device called a ground glass. A ground glass is a viewfinder solution commonly found in reflex cameras. Unlike smooth, transparent glass in a window, a ground glass is rough and frosted, and it allows a lens to focus its light on the glass for viewing. In most applications, a ground glass aids the photographer so they can frame and focus an image before the shutter exposes the negative. But B-Script makes a depth of field adapter, which can be mounted onto the B's cage. This comes with a Canon EF bayonet mount, so you can mount full frame EF lenses directly to the DOF adapter. This means the iPhone is capable of focusing its 24 millimeter lens on the ground glass. As with all lenses that focus light, the image is initially inverted and the Blackmagic app allows you to select flip image for SLR lenses. And now the iPhone is actually viewing an image projected onto the ground glass within the DOF adapter. We got to try B-Script's new Mark III, which retails for $300 and is a big improvement over their Mark II. The downside to this is it only works with certain lens flange depths. You can check out B-Script's YouTube channel to see which lenses are compatible. And we wanted to shoot with an anamorphic lens and that meant we needed to convert the DOF EF adapter to PL. PhotoDio makes an EF to PL adapter for $100, and it's compatible with numerous PL lenses. But we also wanted to try the new Atlas Mercury anamorphic lenses. These lenses are some of the smallest and affordable 1.5 anamorphic lenses on the market. And in terms of high precision, versatile, lightweight anamorphic glass, they are in a class of their own. In fact, visionary director Gareth Edwards used them in the Oscar-nominated film, The Creator, and he actually inspired their construction with Atlas directly. Shannon and I love the versatility of the 42 millimeter and used it for most of the shoot. But to specifically marry Mercury's to the B-Script, we had to make ourselves a custom PL to EF mount. The Mercury anamorphic lenses cover full frame and retail for about $8,000 each. But we found several groups renting sets of three for $400 a day. We mostly use the 42 and the 72 millimeter. In the event we needed any neutral density filtration, we fitted our Mercury's with a Tilta 4x5 clip-on map box, which retails for $255. The map box also allowed us to hold a diopter, which was necessary to get macro shots that went beyond the close focus on the lenses themselves. So the camera you see here is configured with all these items. If you already have the $1,200 iPhone Pro Max, the camera accessories hardware cost comes to $1,052 US. We'll add on the specialty Atlas Mercury lenses, which can be rented for $400 a day. We shot for two days, so that brings this package to $1,852. The combination you see here is not only one of the least expensive anamorphic cine style configurations, it might be the tiniest as well. The crew settled into the technology pretty quickly and everyone was amazed at what we were getting thanks to the talent of Shannon, our camera crew led by Amritha, our gaffer Jacob, our grip and electric team Ryan and Nick, and our production design team led by Ama. When we look at more shots with the iPhone and then the ground glass depth of field adapter, you can see in these additional shots the difference that the investment in a lens makes. Back in episode 10, we talk a lot about this relationship and I recommend checking out that analysis. And as impressed as we were with the result, there are some drawbacks to using ground glass. First, it sucks up a lot of light. Expect to lose about one and a half stops. So you need to compensate either with your lighting, your T-stop or your ISO. Second, it's prone to vignetting, so it's important to use full frame lenses to help cover the ground glass as much as possible. And third, the ground glass itself can be visible as static noise in bright planes that are flat. In dark areas or high frequency images with motion, it's hard to see. But as an example, in this image, you can start to detect the Fresnel characteristics in her face and the boxes in the background, whereas the same shot without the depth of field adapter is much cleaner. Just like any cheap and available solution, there are trade-offs. But in this case, those trade-offs gave us other advantages like size, weight, and cost. I don't think people should sell their cameras and buy an iPhone. The iPhone is a useful tool and accessory to have around for certain shoots. It's a collaborative effort 
to just try a new rig. And I think that's really cool. So there you have it. The world's smallest, cheapest, lightest 4K ProRes anamorphic recording camera system. And pretty much everything on this list can be purchased easily through websites like B&H. But there were some parts that we didn't fully address in this episode, such as wireless video, batteries, power management, and focus pulling. Well, in our next episode, we're not only going to show how we built one of the cheapest wireless video village solutions, we're going to break entirely new ground. And who knows, it might lead to a whole new standard. We're going to see what happens when you combine follow focus with augmented reality. You're not going to believe this.